What have you done for me lately? That might be the motto for our fickle society. Someone does something for us, but then we forget about it. People move from hero to goat in one day. We might ask of government or politician. We might ask of our favorite sports team, what have you done for me lately? Yeah, you won the championship two years ago, but what have you done since? We ask that sometimes even of the church. What have you done for me lately? Is it possible that some would say that to Jesus? We have a proper emphasis in Christianity on Christ's historical ministry on the cross and at the resurrection thousands of years ago. But that was a long time ago. What has Jesus been doing? What has Jesus done for us since then? I think this study, the 13th in our series on the Apostles' Creed, answers that question. The Apostles' Creed, an ancient doctrinal statement of the church, says, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Is that what he's doing now? Is that where he is now? What is he doing for us? Today, our study is on the glorification of Jesus Christ. We've looked at his crucifixion and his resurrection, and now we look after his ascension at where he is today and ask the question, what have you done for me lately? Hi, my name is Pastor Jeff Hartman, pastor of First Baptist Church of Troy, North Carolina, and this is our 13th study in the Apostles' Creed, 13th of 20. And it is on Jesus' present place and Jesus' present ministry for us. Let's start with this place. Where is Jesus? And the creed tells us that he sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. So we're going to focus on where he is first, not his seated position, but his geographical position. He is in heaven, and more specifically, at the right hand of God. This is what the New Testament tells us several times. Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 64, as he is speaking to his enemies, he says, It is as you said, I am the Son of God. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. He wasn't trying to make peace with them by saying, no, 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 that's all right. I'm not that big a deal. No, he just raises the ante. I'm not only who you say, who I say I am, but I am the Son of Man who will sit at the right hand of God himself. There he sits at the right hand of the power. In Mark chapter 16, verse 19, as Jesus is leaving the earth, the very last verses of Mark, Mark says, So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven. That's where we left off last week with the ascension. And he sat down, we'll look at that next, but at the right hand of God, the power that Matthew refers to, is the right hand of God. Whatever's in heaven, there's God the Father, and there's God the Son at his right hand. We see in Acts chapter 2, verse 33, as Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, he says, Jesus, therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he, Jesus, poured out this which you now see and hear. Again, Peter tells those who just had Jesus crucified, Jesus is not only resurrected and ascended, but he's sitting at the right hand of God. Notice he says he is exalted to the right hand. That is the highest place you can be. He is exalted to the right hand of God. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul writes, Which he worked in Christ, God the Father worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, the resurrection, and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So we see the right hand is in heaven, the heavenly places, and notice it is far above all principality and power and might and dominion. This place at the right hand is exalted because it's over all of the angels, every name that is named, not only in this age, but also 
in that which is to come. And so he is above all authority. This is a place of position and authority. And then in Colossians, Paul writes, If then you were raised with Christ, the resurrection, seek those things which are above in heaven, where Christ is. Where is Christ? He's in heaven, above, sitting at the right hand of God. So this is Jesus' exalted place, sitting at the right hand of God. Hebrews says this several times. We'll look at just two now. Hebrews 1, 3, in the third verse, Jesus being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person and upholding all things by the word of his Jesus' power, when he had by himself purged our sins, that's the cross, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Again, an exalted position, a place of majesty and honor. And later on in the same chapter, Hebrews 1.13, but to which of the angels has he, God, ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? The key idea in Hebrews is Jesus is better. Don't go back to the old way. Don't go back to the Old Testament. Not now. Jesus is better. And the first thing that he wants to say is Jesus is better than the angels. And so he goes back to the Psalms and pulls out this quote and says, to which angel did God ever say, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Psalm chapter 2. Here, he is saying Jesus is better than the angels, and there is no angel sitting at the right hand of God. One more, this is from Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. Jesus has gone into heaven. There is the ascension. Peter saw that with his own eyes. Where is he now? Is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. And so Peter also makes this same point. Jesus is now in heaven at the right hand of God in a place of honor, a place of authority. This is a very, very important principle. Jesus is not just dead and gone. He's not just resurrected, but he is glorified. And this place, the right hand, signifies honor and authority. To be at God's right hand is the highest place that he has. This answers our philosophical problem of evil in the world and how in the world can a good God allow bad things to happen. Jesus has the authority and he has the place to overcome that because of his death on the cross, his victory over sin of death at the resurrection, and his place. He is at the place of authority, and so... He's at the right hand, a place of honor and authority. But let's zoom in a little bit more. He sits at the right hand. What position is Jesus in? How is Jesus? He is seated. Remember, he's not just at the right hand of God. The creed says he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And there's something significant about sitting down. Not just that he's tired. Sometimes when we've had a long walk, if we're tired, we look for a place to sit, especially in a public place. I need a place to sit down because we're tired. That's not Jesus. He's not sitting down because he's tired from 33 long years on the earth. No, there's something significant about this position of being seated. So that's why in those verses we just looked at, Matthew 26, 64, Mark 16, 19, he's not only at the right hand of the power, he's not only at the right hand of God. Notice in both places, he is sitting, present tense now, he sat down a past perfect. This means he continues to sit down 2,000 years later. He's still there. But sat down is in the perfect tense, which means it's a past action that has present results. And so instead of saying, I ran, that's past tense, I have run, which means I am done. It's over. And it means it has past results. So I have painted the wall, means the wall is painted. I started in the past, I finished, and it is done or the results continue. Jesus continues to reign at the right hand of the Father. We also looked at Ephesians 1.20 and Colossians 3.1. Right hand of the heavenly places, yes, at the right hand of God. But notice, God seated him at the right hand in Ephesians 1.20. Christ is sitting, continuous present tense, at the right hand of God. It's not only a past action like the crucifixion and the resurrection, but it's a present action. Jesus is sitting. He continues to be there. We saw it in Hebrews 
already twice in Hebrews chapter 1. Not at the right hand of the Father. He sat down at the right hand. He's not standing there. He's not crouching. He's not laying. He's sitting down. And we saw it in verse 13. Sit at my right hand. It's very important. And Hebrews will better than any other book explain to us why there's a significance to Jesus sitting down. Because those are not the only two times that Hebrews mention Jesus' position in heaven. We see him sitting many times in Hebrews, for instance, in Hebrews 8.1. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. Let me get to the point, which is Jesus is better. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now, notice, like in the other verses in Hebrews and elsewhere, he's seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. That's all the different ways we saw Jesus described earlier. He's at the right hand of God, at the throne, the majesty, and the heavens. But the key thing here is seated because he's talking about now our high priest. In Hebrews, when he's making his argument, Jesus is better, he's better than the angels, he's better than Moses, he's better than Joshua who took him into the promised land, he's better than the high priest. Jesus is our high priest, but he's not like the high priest who gave a sacrifice and then had to sacrifice the next day. Jesus gave one sacrifice for all sins for all times. And Jesus is better than the high priest because he's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's not of the tribe of Aaron. He's not of the tribe of Levi. He's of the tribe of Judah. But he has a better priesthood because he doesn't die. He is our eternal one. But here's the point he's making. He's seated. Do you know if you look at the description of all of the furniture in the tabernacle, which was in the wilderness, and then the temple, which was built in Jerusalem, there are no pews, padded or otherwise. There are no chairs for the thrones for the priest to sit on up at the front of the sanctuary. There's no place to sit, and that represents that a priest's job was never done, just like a busy housewife who feels like her job is never done. There's another load of laundry. There's another meal to cook. For the priests in old Israel, they were offering sacrifices every day. The blood was flowing all the time because people continued to sin. But Jesus came, and when he was done offering himself as a sacrifice for sins, he sat down because his job was done. There was no furniture in the tabernacle or the temple because there was no rest. But in Jesus, he rests so that we too might rest. And so to see a high priest seated would be so unusual because he's not a king sitting on the throne. The priest is a servant constantly offering sacrifices. But Jesus offered one sacrifice for sins forever. That's why he sits down. And so Hebrews makes this point in chapter 10, verse 12. This man, after he, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, unlike all those priests, he sat down at the right hand of God. That's where. But why is he seated? Because his job is done. He's not busy offering more sacrifices for sins. He's offered one sacrifice for sins forever, not over and over again at the altar of the Mass. He offered one sacrifice at the cross, at Calvary. And so we see again in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here's that phrase again, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, but he sat down because he is the finisher. And that's why Jesus says on the cross, John chapter 19, verse 30, it is finished. Because sitting down not only signifies honor and authority, it signifies rest because of accomplishment, a job well done, a job completed. Some Christians confuse the perpetual priesthood of Jesus with the perpetual sacrifice. He is our ongoing priest, but he is not offering an ongoing sacrifice every time the elements of communion are taken. He has perpetual intercession for us. The priests continue to pray for us. But Jesus does that, sitting down at the right hand of the Father, because his sacrifice for sins is once for all, forever. It's done. It's finished. 
And so Jesus is sitting down, signifying not only his place of honor, but his place of accomplishment. He has accomplished for us our salvation. One other question we want to ask. Okay, so he's sitting down. Is he just a couch potato up in heaven? He did something for us 2,000 years ago and isn't doing anything now. Maybe he's playing on his phone or some video games. I'm not trying to be sacrilegious here. I'm telling you, Jesus is busy. He's not doing nothing. What is he doing? He sitteth at the right hand, okay, but does that mean that's all he's doing and just waiting for his second coming? Is the second coming the next thing Jesus is going to do? Or is he doing something now? What have you done for me lately? Well, let me tell you, Jesus says. In Acts chapter 7, verse 55, we looked at these verses last week on the ascension. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, as he was being stoned, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, and he saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Notice that. And said, look, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He saw him standing at the right hand of God, and he said, I see him standing at the right hand of God. What does that mean? All these other times we've seen, where is Jesus? He's sitting at the right hand of God. I pointed this out last week. It's significant that he's standing, and I believe this signifies Jesus rising to receive his new believer, his new guest into heaven, to his eternal home. Jesus is here, I believe, preparing to welcome Stephen home. What is Jesus doing? He's sitting, but he's waiting for us to come to the place that he's prepared for us. And so that's what we want to talk about in John chapter 14, a well-known passage. In my father's house are many mansions. Who built all those mansions? Maybe a carpenter from Nazareth? If it were not so, I would have told you. I go, the ascension, to prepare a place for you, his position in heaven. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What is Jesus doing in heaven? Well, somehow, because he's God, he's not only sitting down, but he's preparing a place for us. And the significance of that, if you think about it, is that he created the heavens and the earth, the universe, and everything in it in six days, the seventh day he rested. If he could make this great big universe in six days, just by speaking the word, Jesus can prepare a place for us just by saying, let there be light, let there be life. What has he been doing for the past 2,000 years? And if he tarries another 2,000 years, if he spent six years creating this universe, what must the world to come be like if he's already been working on it for 2,000 years? Wouldn't that be great? to see what God has been doing, what specifically the Son of God has been doing for these past 2,000 years. He's preparing a place for us. But more than that, we've already hinted that in Hebrews, he is a priest. What does a priest do? Back to Hebrews 8.1. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who's seated at the right hand of the throne on the majesty in the heavens. If he's not offering sacrifices anymore, the priest has two big jobs. <clears throat> the priest, let me define that for a moment. A priest is different from a prophet. A priest goes to the people, receives their sacrifice, hears their sins, turns his back on the people and goes to God and said, here's their sacrifices, here are their sins. The prophet has the exact opposite job. The prophet goes to God gets the message from God, turns his back on God, and goes to the people and says, Thus saith the Lord. Now, Jesus is both a prophet and a priest. Very rare to be both, but Samuel is one of those who's a prophet and a priest. So what he is saying here as a priest, he is going from the people to God. Now, if he's not offering a sacrifice anymore, which he's already done once for all, he's doing the other job of the priest. The priest goes to God with the prayers of the people their prayers of confession. He goes and he intercedes. And this is jo the job of Jesus that continues. Because Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, his job continues. But there is no more sacrifice for sins. And so what he does now for us is he intercedes or he prays for us. Think about how important this is. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, Paul says, Jesus 
who is he who con who is he condemns? It is Christ who died, his death, furthermore is also risen, his resurrection, who is even at the right hand of God, that's his position at glorification in heaven, who, what is he doing now? Who makes intercession for us. If you knew someone was praying for you, would you feel a little bit better if the pastor says, I'm praying for you because you got the surgery on that day? If your doctor says, I'm praying for you as you're going to surgery, that might make you feel better. What if you knew someone in heaven was praying for you? What if that one in heaven praying for you was seated at the right hand of the Father and was Jesus Christ himself? Jesus' place in heaven is not just sitting there playing on his phone, but it is praying and praying for you. Isn't that exciting? Is he praying vocal prayers? Is he praying to the Father? Is he turning to God and talking about what we're doing here? We don't know he's God and he's interceding for all of us at one time because he's infinite and he can do what he wants. But here's the point. Jesus is in heaven being our high priest. And Hebrews says in chapter 7, verse 25, he also is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Just like a parent praying for their child, taking him to the first day of school, or when they're out on their first date, or when they're driving for the first time. Our Heavenly Father has someone at his right hand praying for us, and he's praying for us as his children. He lives to make intercession for us. Isn't that precious? What has he done for us lately? He's been praying for you. Isn't that encouraging? There's one more thing that I want you to see that Jesus is doing for us in heaven. Revelation 12, 10 gives us an insight to some of the inner workings of what's going on there. John says, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, the accuser, the prosecutor, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. In one sense, Jesus Christ's death on the cross has once for all dealt with all of our sins. But does the accuser still go before God like we see him going in Job and accusing and saying, oh, Job's not all that. If you just took away your hand of blessing on him, then he would curse you. And so there is one, Satan, who before God accuses us. That's one of his titles. He's the accuser, the prosecutor of the brethren. Well, boy, you don't want to go into a court without a lawyer, right? The good news is 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 tells us you have a lawyer. You have an advocate with the Father. John says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, well, we all sin. We're all still fallen, even after all of our sins for, are forgiven. We need to go back to the Father and confess our sins and make things right with him. But if we sin, and we will, we have an advocate. We have an intercessor. We have, this is the word that you would use for a defense attorney. You ever seen the end of a movie or the end of a television show about a legal court proceeding? And when the court is all finished with the, the trial and the judge is going to pass sentence, he says, please rise. And when the defendant stands up, the accused stands up, the lawyer stands up too. The lawyer's not going to jail with that person, but stands up with them. That is the picture of Jesus standing up next to us. When Satan accuses us, Jesus stands up for us and says, no, wait a minute, this one is mine. I paid for all of their sins past, present, and future. And so when someone points a finger at you and you have wronged them, you need to confess that to them. But when it comes to God, your sins are forgiven. And our advocate in heaven, who has a great record, by the way, you know, if you know the old court drama, Perry Mason, which had 300 episodes on TV, Perry Mason always got his defendant off. They were always innocent. Wouldn't you love to have all innocent uh, when you're talking about those that you are defending. Okay? He had out of 300 cases, 297 found innocent, only three convictions. Well, Jesus' record is perfect. All of those that receive his gift of salvation are forgiven, and he is our advocate. When we say, what have you done for me lately? I'm not asking that irreverently of Jesus. If he never did anything but die on the cross for my sins and rise from the dead, I would be indebted to him forever. 
But I'm asking a question of interest. What are you doing now? What about a mother who gives birth to a child at great pain and great sacrifice and then never again lifted a finger to help that child? Maybe that child would die. Why do we love mothers? Not just because years ago they gave birth to us, but because of the many ways that they served us, they fed us, they loved us. Not just their past sacrifice, but their continuous ministry of love. That's why we love mothers. Mother's Day is coming up in a month. Why do we love Jesus? Not just because of what he did thousands of years ago, but because what he's doing right now in heaven for us. His motherly love for us. What has he done for us lately? He's preparing a place for us. As a priest, he's prayed for us. As a defendant, he stood up for us. And that's why we love him so much. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for what you did on the cross. Thank you for what you did rising from the dead and then going to heaven. But we thank you for what you're doing for us right now. It encourages us to know that you know what we're going through and you pray for us. It encourages us to know that you are our advocate. And Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. We love you because you first loved us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Join us again next week for the next study on Jesus' second coming.